welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. What you're about to listen to is a one-part solo episode where I develop, I believe, an original account of humiliation and its role in political theory, particularly its role in neo-republican democratic ideology. A lot of what I'm talking about builds on my Machiavelli series, You don't need to have listened to that to appreciate this episode. I do offer a summary of my arguments and my approach in that. And then if you want more detail on that, you can go back to the Machiavelli series where I explore them in much more depth. But I just wanted to zero in on this episode on the concept of humiliation, which does a lot of work in that series but I didn't develop a particularly clear account of. So I really dig in and go into some depth on it here. And this is part of an account of politics that, you know, long-time listeners will have been able to see me develop in real time, actually, on this podcast, where I bring you my thoughts, I answer audience questions, I go on other people's shows and defend them, I have guests on, and occasionally I try out a particular line of argumentation on them. It's a very public and quite unique way of creating a political theory. It's been terrific to, to, to sort of develop ideas in this way, in this public kind of communal way. So I would absolutely love your feedback on this. If you think elements of this work, if you have other ideas, if you think I'm dangerously wrong, you know, tweet at me, email me. I'm really genuinely curious to see what people make about this. It is something original. And it is something a bit different. I don't know that I've heard anything like this before. Maybe I'm giving myself too much credit and uh, there's some stuff I'm not thinking of. I certainly do try to show my sources and my citations wherever possible. But yeah, please do get in touch. As always, if you like the show, please do share it. Um, I'm very grateful for some of the growth that we've had on this show. So if you think this is interesting, please do share so that other people can pick it up too. Apart from that, let's get straight to it. This is a solo episode. It is a little bit longer than some of the others, but I decided to just do it as one self-contained argument. I got a little bit carried away, but I just find this stuff so interesting, and I kind of nerd out on it, and I tried to get a lot of stuff in here, and yeah, like I say, let me know what you think. So yeah, without any further preamble, this is me discussing the political role of humiliation. in middle school, so that's, I don't know, this is in the UK, maybe 10, 12, something like that, I remember I went through a period where I would get picked on, bullied if you will, by a group of the more popular boys. It was only for a few years, I sort of grew out of it, I learned to play the social hierarchy game a little bit better in high school, but Just on the pre-teen years, I went through a pretty bad patch. I should say it was mostly non-physical. You know, name-calling, mocking, stuff like that. I remember really clearly this one instance where I was walking back to a classroom. I think I'd been just returning from the restrooms or something. And a group of them who also happened to be out wandering the hallways found me and were you know, laughing at me, calling me names. And I remember very clearly, I just burst out of them. I said, what did I even do to you? 
You know, like, like, say, what's this about? Why are you doing this to me? And I remember just shouting that at them. What did I even do to you? And this didn't have the effect that I don't know if I had any particular intentionality behind that outburst, but it didn't go as planned because they thought this was hilarious. And all of them started repeating it back in this sort of sing-song voice, um, sort of mocking the way I talked, I guess. Um, what did I do to you? What did I do to you? Like like that. And it went on um, as I sort of like gave up, exasperated. And I just went back to walking back to my classroom. They, they followed behind me, about five to eight feet behind me, just all saying that same thing again. And again, in that little sing-songy voice. And this, this incident came back to me recently because I've been thinking about the idea of, in the context of political theory, the role of humiliation. The idea of feelings of being humiliated, I'm beginning to think play a much bigger role in our politics than our analytic political theory allows, if it even accords any particular role to them at all. And this image came back to me. And in that image, in the, the, the feelings there, the sudden outburst on my part, and then also in the feelings of anger on my part, I think there's a lot of stuff that is actually really fundamental to understanding how our political world works. And I don't mean, by the way, to sound too self-pitying, even with that story. I'm not telling it to you to ask for sympathy points. That's not the point of it. I'm well aware <laughs> that... that um, my schoolyard scuffles as I had them are very, very trivial to what even other people <laughs> in my school, some kids absolutely got torn to pieces every single day, you know, even in my, my own school that I went to. Um, and then if you think about how people are bullied and humiliated globally, it, you know, it's a blip in the ocean, right? I mention it. Because I can still feel, I can still taste that anger. It's still real for me, in a sense. 20 years later, that memory is still there. I can still visualize it. I can still access what that corridor looked like through those emotions. Humiliation is a very, very powerful psychological experience. And it's one that's transformative of people. The changes it affects in people are deep-seated and long-lasting. I'm sure that my experiences, the one of which I've just relayed to you, are feelings of powerlessness, feelings of anger about it, have in some sense, for better or for worse, probably for the worse, made me who I am today. In some ways, it makes me more empathetic. There's, I can relate to other people when they're in the victim role, maybe a bit better. But in some senses, I don't doubt that it drives feelings of anger in me. Feelings of how I respond to men and to women differently. Feelings of not trusting people. And we all know that to be true. We all know that moments of humiliation are incredibly powerful and transformative psychological experiences. I think you know that. And I think if you consult your intuitions and your life story, you'll find that to be true. That sort of introspective evidence, however, isn't the sort of data points that political theory normally considers when constructing an account. We look at big concepts, we look at institutions, we 
we look at history and we systematize, we organize, we try to produce um, a, a, a coherent and rational account of what's happening in our political world. An account that does often involve room for the emotions, but I think can struggle sometimes to incorporate feelings like the one I just described. And I think humiliation is particularly hard because, as I'm going to argue in a minute, a lot of the behaviours that we adopt around acts of humiliation, both on the part of the victims and the perpetrators, are not just not primarily irrational, they're specifically and overtly irrational. They can't be explained by our dominant modes of thinking about rationality, and they certainly can't be explained by the, like this quite narrow idea of rational individual self-interest that underpins and structures a lot of our political theory. So, one of the projects I've had on this podcast is I've been trying to give an account which certainly isn't, you know, completely original and unique to me. I'm drawing from a lot of people. But to sketch out a political theory, a normative political theory, a political theory about how we ought to behave and how we ought to look at the world and see it and interact with it, but to sketch out a political theory that brings back in the immediate and the visceral and the painful Stuff that is difficult to explain, if not impossible, actually, I would argue, with a purely rationalistic and rationalising view. Something that's also just, let's be real about this, difficult to talk about. We don't like reliving moments of humiliation, much less talking to others about them. And more than that, we don't like talking about the fact that we too desire to humiliate people, that we have done it ourselves, and that we've gained satisfaction from it, and we probably will again. That's even more than admitting moments of powerlessness. That's a social taboo, right? So this is, this is hard, but I, I wanted to try and come to an account of this, because the, the sketch that I was talking about came from my Machiavelli series, where I tried to give a sort of riff, a variant, on neo-Republican ideology, and say, let's make a few tweaks and see how this thing looked. So I started with the idea of non-domination in Machiavelli, and argued that it was actually a little bit different to the idea of non-domination we find in the work of contemporary Republicans like Quentin Skinner and Philip Pettit. And one of the concepts I realised towards the end, actually, that was doing a lot of work in that account, but I hadn't really provided a clear explanation of, was humiliation. Before we get to that, though, let's tidy up some terms. So I said humiliation, I think, can play a useful role in neo-Republican ideology. Specifically, I'm arguing that humiliation can be introduced as an adjacent concept within a neo-Republican ideological framework. Okay, so what do any of those words mean? Right. Um, So republicanism is a tradition within the history of political thought. It's a political belief system, as I label it. It's a political ideology that has at its heart the idea of freedom as non-domination, in contrast to how we talk about freedom a lot of the time where we understand freedom as non-constraint. So to just take the classic instance of that, If you live under an absolute ruler who is benevolent and who leaves you alone, are you free? Well, it sort of depends what you mean by freedom, right? If freedom means non-constraint, the absence of deliberate interpersonal constraints, as I've put it sometimes, then yes, you are. You're being left alone. No one's interfering with you. You're free. If, however, freedom means non-domination, it means that there is no one who has the ability to constrain your actions, 
well then, no, you're not free. And I think there's a sort of just intuitive soundness to the Republican conception, right? Is you might live under the most wonderful absolute ruler in the world. They're not quite good enough, apparently, that they'll give up that power, but they're going to exercise it in a responsible way. You are still at the mercy of that ruler. They can have you rounded up and executed or tortured or any other horrible thing at any point. So then, no, in that sense, you're not free. This is actually, by the way, sort of what ideologies do. They provide meanings to these these very difficult, very big, contested words like freedom. And you can see from that initial conception of what freedom is that the natural logic, the natural impetus of republicanism would be against concentrations of unaccountable power. It would be against anyone who can be in these positions of domination, right? And on the converse of that, it would be for power that is constrained, power that is accountable, power that everybody can have a say in, this idea of popular, participatory, democratic use of power. This is a very Republican set of ideas, or adjacent concepts, as I call them. And the sort of end result of all of that is you want a system of governance in which the popular will ultimately rules constrained by rule of law. In other words, a republic. Hence the name, right? Um, And republicanism is something that people have traced back to the ancient world. It's something that um, was big during the Renaissance when, you know, the divine right of kings gave way a little, and particularly in Italy, but other places. um, These sort of city-states came up with more quasi-democratic, let's say, constitutions, and republicanism became the theoretical justification of that in a world where one-man autocratic rule was the norm. It was also quite big during the English Revolution, so John Milton, for instance, writing in support of the short and ill-fated British Commonwealth, is sort of a classical Republican thinker. Um, And then more recently, it's undergone a revival, a renaissance, with figures like Quentin Skinner, and friend of the podcast, Philip Pettit, have done a lot of work in going back and saying, hey, this is actually um, something that's interesting and useful and important and normative for understanding the world today. So you have, um, you know, Skinner and Pettit and others arguing today for freedom as non-domination, and Philip Pettit in particular links it both to sort of participatory um, self-rule as a form of government, but he also extends that argument out in other directions, looking at republicanism as a justification for a number of left-wing policies to do with a more egalitarian society, workers' rights, equal rights for historically disenfranchised groups. And overall, um, republicanism is a vision of the world that I've always found interesting and compelling. I personally still kind of think of myself as a progressive liberal, and it's an interesting question as to how far those two belief systems can sort of like coexist or overlap with each other. I won't get into that here. But I think there's a lot to be said for republicanism. And that account of the world, which at its heart has the idea of freedom as non-domination, surrounded by a range of adjacent concepts such as self-rule, political participation, constrained power, and so on, and cashed out by some of the policies that uh, Pettit has argued for, that is the vision of the world that I was sort of doing a riff on with my Machiavelli series. I was sort of saying, let's take that structure, make a few tweaks, and then see what it looks like with those tweaks. The other word to just quickly provide a definition of is ideology. I view republicanism in general and neo-republicanism specifically, as well as my own quirky variant of it, I view these as political ideologies. 
and I don't mean anything bad by that. To me, an ideology is a particular arrangement of essentially contestable concepts. Essentially contestable concepts are things like freedom, justice, power, fairness. Words that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. We saw just now that freedom can mean constraint to some people, or non-constraint, sorry, and non-domination to others. To others it can mean autonomy or the market. What ideologies are is their particular arrangements of conceptions of those concepts. So, concretely, an ideology will say, this is our account of what freedom is, this is our account of what justice is, and so on and so forth, and it'll tie those together into a recognisable pattern. Now, that pattern may exist as a conscious construction, or, and more commonly, as unconscious primings that we have. We often just sort of know, quote-unquote, that something is unfair or unjust. But where does that knowledge come from? It's not natural. That is our political ideology at work. And what ideologies do is by providing meanings to these key words, to these key concepts, they allow us to understand the social and political world. They provide a language through which we can express thoughts, sentiments, uh, priorities, and demands. And they provide a mechanism through which elites can mobilize support around particular policies. The thing is, of course, there isn't just one political ideology. There's a whole bunch of them. And you can sort of group these together into big families. So you can talk about liberal ideology, general, or liberal ideologies might be more accurate, where liberalism is sort of a family term covering a number of different variants. You can talk about republicanism, which we have. Uh, you can talk about socialism and all the different socialist ideologies, conservatism, libertarianism fascism, and so on and so forth. And they sort of wane and wax over history. Sometimes one will become more dominant, sometimes another will. But they can't all be true at once, right? Either you are free or an, under an absolute ruler, or you're not. So there, there are these moments of stark contradiction. And then on a practical level, of course, either we're going to have a welfare state or we're not, and that's just sort of what politics is, right? Politics is the domain of contestation. It's the arena in which collective decisions are attempted. So, because there's all these different ideologies, and because they have at their heart um, particular ideas about what these core values terms mean, particular conceptions of those essentially contestable concepts, one of the primary actions of political ideologies is they compete with each other for the socially legitimated and sanctioned meaning of those words. Freedom means this, says Republicans. Oh, no, it doesn't. Freedom means this, says liberals. Well, actually, you both have it wrong. Freedom actually means this, says libertarians. Libertarians, um... When I do this podcast, I realise I always give them a sort of dismissive, nasally voice. This is kind of how I hear libertarians talk. I should probably stop that. That's not, that's not super, super duper respectful. So we all have political ideologies, and we wouldn't be capable of thinking about describing the political world without them. We wouldn't be capable of making statements about collective aspirations that could be understood by others without political ideologies. So when I say I consider neo-republicanism an ideology, I'm not saying it's that it's irrational or anything like that. I'm saying that it is engaged in the competition over the control of language, and that at its heart it has a particular set of ideas about what these key terms mean, and it links those ideas together in a recognisable structure that is then used to give an account of 
the social and political world, as well as to justify and to urge support for particular policies. So one final bit of table setting, if you can call it that, that we can do is to just quickly say a word about the structure of ideologies, because my whole argument about republicanism can be seen as tweaking that structure. In other words, creating a slightly different picture, a different schema. I tend to see ideologies visually, and I'm not alone in that. I know Michael Frieden talks about seeing them visually, and generally when we talk about policy preferences, we see them visually as well, right, as a policy, as a, as a political spectrum, with left-wing and right-wing, and it might be one-dimensional, it might be two, but we do tend to form visual pictures of these systems of ideas. Now, when you're considering political ideologies as total units, so not just the policy preferences, but the values that underpin them as well, then the left-right spectrum is no longer so useful um, as a visual representation of that thought system. And one of the metaphors I used repeatedly as a sort of idea to cue you in about what we're describing visually here in my libertarian series is the idea of an atom. So I picture ideologies as concentric layers emerging out from a central point. So you might think by analogy of um, the different layers of skin on an onion. Perhaps there's a M.C. Escher painting called Concentric Rhines that um, Michael Frieden says in his very short introduction to ideologies for him is very evocative of the internal structure of an ideology. But work with me for a moment on my atom one. There's three layers emerging from a center to an ideolo ideology as a structure of concepts. The first we call the core then the adjacent, and then the perimeter. So the core is the most central ideas, the most valued things. What is the ultimate appeal, right? And so let's do, let's do this as we go along for republicanism. So what are its most central ideas? Well, by its own admission, the really sort of Fonzette Orica, the, the moral and practical and ideological full stop for republicanism is freedom as non-domination. So I, I think we can just take that at face value and say two core concepts for republicanism are freedom and are non-domination. And the what ideologies do is they link those ideas up. They say freedom is non-domination. To be dominated is to not be free, and to be non-dominated is to be free. So they're, they're mutually defining, right? Now, the next layer, and by analogy, um, progressive liberalism in its place, might have freedom and autonomy as two core concepts. Liberalism has a slightly bigger core with more concepts in it. It also has rationality in it, for instance, a limited and accountable power, individuality, a few other things. But at our core, you have the most valued or prized or cherished ideas that are mutually defining. But th that's not really good enough in itself, is it, right? You say, okay, freedom means not to be dominated. Okay, cool. So what do you do with that? So the next layer out is the adjacent. And let's just go through this again for republicanism. And these are ideas that sort of flesh out and add a little bit of extra detail to the core concepts, give you a sense of like, of sort of what's going on here, right? So for republicanism, I think the ideas of self-rule, I think the ideas of a participatory arena of politics, um, these, are, these are the sorts of things that are uh, autarky of the political unit would be another one. These are sorts of the ideas to which republicanism appeals to flesh out those most central core concepts. And then finally, around the adjacent concepts, you have what's called the perimeter, which is where those concepts link up with real-world 
policy preferences. So it's the perimeter, as in it's the border, the barrier, the, the, um, the permeable membrane, if you will, through which we link up political thought and political action. And this is what one of the things ideologies do for us, is they provide a bridge from our values to our actions. What do we ultimately believe is correct and normative to what are we going to do? So for republicanism, now Quentin Skinner doesn't have a well-developed perimeter. He tends to just bring us an arrangement of core and adjacent concepts. But for the perimeter for Philip Pettit, he has a sort of broadly um, set of left-wing policies. So in traditional sort of Renaissance republicanism, the big perimeter concept would be a republican constitution, wherein you have laws and arrangements such that people can vote and so on, but the outcomes are still constrained by law. So that's a sort of classic traditional republican perimeter concept. And Quentin Skinner, uh, sorry, Philip Pettit adds a number of ones to that to do with strengthening protections for the working class and trying to have a vision of the world where all sorts of different forms of domination are removed, both government and non-government. Now, What does that do? Well, these things are all hooked up together. So here's my metaphor of the atom, is if you make changes in the nucleus of an atom, you know, there's that bit in the middle of the atom where the protons and neutrons are. Not, by the way, I am not um, a scientist, so don't quote me on any of this stuff. But if you make changes there, then it'll change the number of electrons whizzing around the edge of the atom that that can support. Likewise, if you make changes to the core and adjacent concepts, it'll change what concepts can be supported at the perimeter. So to take an obvious example, if one of your core concepts is a strongly libertarian conception of freedom, it's gonna, that isn't going to support a perimeter concept of the government owning the means of production. There's some highly theoretical people who will say, I have a libertarian conception of freedom, and I ultimately support state socialism. But that's not an ideological configuration that's ever really going to catch on in the real world, I don't think. So if you change something at the core, the perimeter will also change. And What I argued is let's go in, so we've got this model, right, this atom, however you want to think about it, where at the core you've got freedom as non-domination, you know, fleshed out by self-rule of the individual, self-rule of the political unit, uh, participation in politics, leading outwards to ideas of republican governance and a more egalitarian society. And I said, let's, let's, let, let's tweak it a little. Let's add into the adjacent this Machiavellian idea of the haves and the have-nots. This idea that Machiavelli has that the rich are necessarily greedy and usurping and they desire to dominate and humiliate the lower classes. And the lower classes, in turn, desire not to be dominated, not to be humiliated. What does that do? Well, one way to think about this structure is you can draw a line from the center to the perimeter or from the perimeter to the center. And that line is, in effect, a political argument. This is a really novel and interesting way that I get from ideological theory about thinking about what political arguments are. Right. So, in other words, start at the center core and let's just create, let's just draw a line to the outside. Um, So let's say in order to be free, you can't be dominated. That means there can be no one ruling over you. You must be your own master and your own man or woman. What that means is there can never be any authoritarian leader, any power exercised over you. You must be able to have a say in. What that means in practice 
is we need to have a Republican constitution in which everyone can have a say in their governance constrained by law. So you see what we did there? That's a political argument, right? We started at the middle and drew a line out. You can also do it the other way back. You can say, we need a Republican constitution because that way people have a say in politics, everyone is their own master, and that equals a state of freedom because freedom is to be non-dominated. So you can do it both ways. What happens to those arguments when you get in these Machiavellian ideas of the rapacious, greedy, arrogant, and critical to this episode, desiring to humiliate upper class? Well, it flexes it up a bit. Um, It means the, the argument becomes something like this. The best constitution is a mixed constitution because... There will always in any state be rich people and poor people. The rich people will desire to dominate and to humiliate those below them. And those below them in turn desire not to be dominated, not to be humiliated. So by constraining the different parties within that system, by allowing space for you know, the lower classes to exist free from humiliation, they can have a set of bonds, a set of customs with each other in which they resist that domination. And in that resistance, they become free. Freedom is, by my account here, a set of traditions, of mores, of customs. It's a resolve commonly held amongst the comparatively powerless, that they will not be dominated. They will not be humiliated. They will not live on their knees as the abject slaves of an arrogant and capricious and fickle ruling class. No. It is the unity we find with our brothers in asserting, no, there are limits. We have our pride. And it is the meaning and value that we find in that collective act of resistance. So I talked about it as resistance freedom. Another way of putting it is the change you get to that core concept through the inclusion of these adjacent concepts of the haves and the have-nots, as well as humiliation, is instead of thinking about freedom as non-domination, we're thinking about freedom as resistance to domination. One way you could think about that is like as an ideal and a non-ideal theory. Ideal theory is what's our perfect utopian sketch. In our perfect utopian sketch, these relations of domination don't exist at all. There's no masters. There's no one who has the power to humiliate you much less is actually doing so. There's no tyrannical boss. There's no bouncer yelling at you as you wait to go into the club. There's no police officer making you nervous as you sweat out a traffic stop. Those things don't exist. The power that is exercised over you operates on your terms and with your ability to influence it and redirect it. That's the utopian vision. That's the ideal theory of freedom as non-domination. My account takes place more in the real world. It's a freedom that is accessible to us in the now, and that is the freedom in resisting partially and incompletely, and maybe without any ultimate goal, those who would try to humiliate you. It is the freedom to walk down the school corridor Confident that you'll, you can stand up for yourself, that you have your own friends and they'll have your back. It's not that the bullies have gone away. It's that you've found a way of asserting yourself in the face of that. Now, I put that out there, and a lot of people have said that they got something out of it. The other thing, of course, that it does is it not only impacts the core, it not, not only gives us a different sketch of freedom, it, it reconfigures the perimeter as well. So this stays a left-wing egalitarian 
construct, but it's one that becomes much more open to, and much more vociferous in its support of, class conflict. This is an overtly now pro-class conflict ideology that I've created, or sketched out. Now, in sketching that out, I realised I'd put a lot of weight on this idea of humiliation, and it got to me thinking, is there anywhere a philosophy of humiliation, specifically within the Republican tradition, ideally, but is there an account of what's going on here? Because it seems to play a really big role in Machiavelli. Machiavelli's whole theory of the state is prefaced on this idea. That, and just, this is just a quote here. In every state, there are two classes, the haves and the have-nots. The desire of the haves, the Italian word is grandi. Don't you love my Italian accent? So good, isn't it? I, could, I should be a romance languages teacher. Get three minutes into a lecture before everyone realises the, the scam. But in every state, there are two classes, the haves and the have-nots. The desire of the haves is to dominate and humiliate, and the desire of the have-nots is not to be dominated and not to be humiliated. And it is from that opposition that all laws favourable to liberty have their origin. End quote. It's one of the more discussed aspects of Machiavelli. So I've talked a lot about domination, and domination has a clearly defined account of itself within Republican theory. To be dominated is when someone or some group of persons can exercise power over you arbitrarily, with no checks on it. So you know, the, the classic example would be if you live under an absolute ruler, you are in a state of domination, and hence, according to Republican theory, are not free, even if that ruler exercises that power in a way that's benevolent. So, domination has, you know, a long literature cashing out what that means. Humiliation, not so much. And when I sort of looked at humiliation as a concept within Republican theory, what I found seemed to be accounts of something else. So, here's what it's not. It's not shame. Shame has a big role in political theory, including in Republican political theory as something to which we can appeal to motivate people to behave morally. So, you know, people say they feel embarrassed, humiliated, whatever, when they do something wrong. And even if no one catches it, they, they still feel this feeling. To my account, that's not humiliation, or at least that's not the type of humiliation that I think Machiavelli is talking about and that I'm leaning on so heavily, that's something different. So I would say shame is when you act in a way that you know is wrong, and you feel regret, remorse, guilt, self-abasement, something like that. Now, that's actually been fairly well explored in the moral philosophy literature, because moral philosophers are always sort of thinking, well, how do we get people to be moral? And shame. Shame is a way that you could conceivably get people to be moral. And it's also not embarrassment. When I say the wrong thing in public, or, you know, I accidentally walk into a lamppost on the street, I did this recently, actually. I have this, like, weird thing where I walk really fast and I text at the same time, and the the liabilities of this get, get painfully impressed on you when the movie of your life skips forward by five minutes and you wake up on your back realising you've literally knocked yourself out walking into a lamppost. Um, that's embarrassing. I wouldn't say that seems to be what we're referencing here. Embarrassment, I would say, is just general feelings of self-consciousness or awkwardness. But it isn't closely tied to this idea of domination. To my account, okay, so I'll just give it to you. This is my account of what I think humiliation is. And I think it's specifically tied to, 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 to the state of being dominated. And 
I'm going to define humiliation around the idea of an action rather than as around the idea of a feeling. So for the rest of this episode, I'm going to be talking about acts of humiliation or humiliating acts as primary primary to my definition as opposed to feelings. And I've kept it fairly simple, but a humiliating act to my account is an act that occurs within a relationship of domination in which the dominating party acts so as to highlight the existence of that domination to the dominated and does so in a way without the consent of the dominated. So to my account, there's there's three things that an act has to have for it to be a humiliating act or a humiliating action. Or it, it sounds better in my head, you can tell me what you think, to say an act of humiliation. First, an act of humiliation is an act that occurs within an asymmetric power relationship, within a relationship of domination. That's the first thing. The first thing, it is something a dominator, either singular or plural, does to the dominated. Again, either singular or plural. And it's done for the primary intention of highlighting, of making the dominated aware of their domination, of sort of rubbing their noses in it essentially. Rubbing salt in the wound. Pick your metaphor. So that's the second element. And the final one is it's done without the consent of the dominated, and it's usually done in the face of that consent. It's done to highlight, indeed, the fact that they can't express non-consent. That's sort of what dom- what humiliation is to me. A hum- an act of humiliation is an act of saying, I'm going to do this to you, and you can't do anything about it. Sit back. You can't stop me. So, let let, let me give a couple of examples to cash them out. The the big classical one that kept coming to my mind for this is the the Vey Victor story. Do you all know this? If you don't, let's let's do this one, because it's a really fun little bit of Roman mythology. So, yeah, story time with Toby. Uncle, let's gather around the fire and link, listen to Uncle Toby's ramblings. Um, but Ve Victus is a story from the early founding of Rome. People argue if it's historical. Some people think it might be completely mythical. I've no idea. But anyway, this is the story. So way back in the day before Rome was powerful, it was just a small city-state. They get defeated by a bunch of barbarians, and the barbarians come right to the city gates, and they say, we're going to destroy your city, and if you don't want us to, you have to pay up. So the Romans say, shoot, you got us. Okay, fine. And they go out, and they negotiate a deal, and eventually they they agree, we'll give you a thousand pounds of gold if you don't sack our city and you leave us alone. Now, so far, I would say having to pay that bribe to stay safe might not quite yet qualify for a humiliating act. Because there's sort of a rational self-interest here, right? Like, the Romans don't want their city to be destroyed, and the barbarians will say, okay, the sort of comparative utility of the gold that we, you know, what we could get out of that is greater than the comparative utility of us having to sack the city and all of the pain and misery, you know, we'd, we'd go through to get it, we don't want to risk any of it. There's sort of a rational self-interest, right, account of why they do that. So here's, here's where the story gets interesting, is the Romans, you know, fill their carts with gold, and they go out and they set up this great big ornate scale, and on the one side they put, like, you know, iron or something, right, and they load the scale up with iron and say, okay, you've got to keep putting your gold on this scale, until it balances and so that you know we know we've got the thousand pounds of gold and they're loading it up and they're loading it up and the roman ambassador is sort of saying hang on this isn't right we've already put way more than a thousand pounds of you know we agreed we agreed hang on mr mr you know gothic chieftain we you know little spectacles 
out, we agreed, Mr. Gothic Chieftain, that we would only pay a thousand guns of gold, and I think you're using some fake weights, and I'm going to have to check them. And the Chieftain draws his sword, which you sort of imagine is this huge, heavy, you know, steel, clunky thing he uses for cleaving his enemies up. And he throws the sword onto the scales on the iron side so that the amount of gold the Romans are going to have to put is now even more. So he's not even pretending that it's fair. And he says to the Romans, ve victus, which has become this thing, this mantra through all of Roman thought. And it means woe to the vanquished. Another way of putting it is the Latin proverb, the strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. So to my mind, that is an act of humiliation, because it's occurring within a relationship of domination. Like, the the barbarians have the power to destroy Rome. It's entirely up to them whether they do so or not. And the primary purpose isn't some rational self-interest thing. The primary purpose is to highlight that domination. And it's done, of course, and it's done without consent. The Romans, do, you know, the Romans just have to pay the extra gold. There's nothing you can do. So yeah, even though the barbarian chieftain got a bit of extra gold out of it, I don't think, well, <laughs> if I can put myself in the head of some likely mythical barbarian chieftain two and a half thousand years ago, but I don't think he did it for the extra gold. I think he did it to prove that he could do it. And that, to my mind, is the distinctive feature of an act of humiliation. It's done to, within a relationship of domination, to highlight that domination. Let me give you another example. I found a video Online, I'm not going to share it because I think it's reprehensible. But um, of uh, uh, in my hometown, there's a local homeless man who's a bit of a character, and everyone sort of knows him. And for some reason, people were sharing this online, where some young people my age went past him and they said, "Oh, hey, you know, you want some money?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I need some money, man." And they say, "Oh, you know," and they hold out the note in front of him, like, "Oh, you want some money?" dance for it. He's like, what? And they're like, I want to see you dance. He's like, oh, you, I, I didn't, I, and they're like, oh, well, no, no money then. He's like, wait, wait, I'll, I'll dance. This guy does a little jig and everyone's laughing and people were sharing this because they thought it was hilarious. I thought that was terrible. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to do to someone. That is an act of humiliation. Let's just have a look at it. It occurs within a relationship of domination. We might not think about it as much, but I would say that extreme income inequality is a relationship of domination. It's a relationship of domination between groups, not between individuals. But I would say the features of domination, as generally understood in Republican theory, you know, are definitely there for the homeless. They have a huge amount of power exercised over them that they have no say into. You know, they can't, the homeless can't enter the same stores as the rest of us. They, they, anything material sustenance they get, they have to beg for, literally. You know, I would say that's a relationship of domination. And what's the purpose of the act? Well, you know, the people who did it might not have thought about it as such. And if you'd have asked them to defend themselves, they'd have probably just said something like, oh, well, because it's funny. I don't, I don't think this is what, how they would have self-consciously processed it. But looking at it from the outside, it seems pretty clear that the purpose of that act was to make it clear the fact that there was a power differential. You were at my mercy. Your ability to get a hot meal tonight is dependent on me. I can give it to you. And I can give it to you for really no cost to me. I'm not going to miss this 10 bucks. Well, this was in the UK, so 10 quid. But yeah, whatever, right? You're not... I, I can, out of pure whim, at complete discretion, I can decide whether or not you eat tonight. And you have 
no way of compelling me to act in a benevolent way. It's completely unaccountable, this power. So I could just give you the money. There would still be a relationship of domination if I just happened to give some money to a homeless person. So the, the domination is always there. What makes it an act of humiliation is the fact that I do it in a way designed to rub their nose in it. And finally, without their consent. That, if it was consensual, that wouldn't be an act of humiliation. If, say, there was a homeless person who was trying to make money by dancing and people gave tips to them, my moral reaction to that, my sort of gut impulse that there's something really unpleasant and disturbing about this, would be completely different. Now, I still don't think there should be homeless people. I still think we should work to remove these things. But the lack of consent there, that guy wanted his hot meal at the end of the night, he had to dance. So I would say that's an act of humiliation as well. Let's look at the story I started the episode with. Why were those boys following me down the hall, going, oh, what did I do to you? What did I do to you? What did I do to you? What was that about? Well, again, I don't think they would have put it in exactly these words. But this was a relationship of domination. They, you know, there was more of them. They had more, uh, let's, put it, let's put this in real political philosophy terms. They had more social capital. They had more standing in that community, right? There's, there's, you know, there's not much I can do to protest my being bullied. There isn't. I can't fight eight other people. I can, but not successfully. Um, you know, I can't try and invoke an authority figure without retaliation. And I don't have a big enough or strong enough or popular enough friendship group to respond. So there is a relationship of domination there. But then they're going to act in a way to highlight that to me. You know, I've sort of said, hey, what did I do? Like, what do you, what do you guys, I guess what I was trying to say is like, what do you want, you know? And they're going to follow me behind to essentially say, there is nothing you can do about this. We're going to make it as clear as we can to you that there's no, there's no argument you can give us. There's no power that you can exercise that might be restraining. I mean, they wouldn't have used any of these words, right? And finally, in a way that's done, obviously, without my consent, right? You know, if it was friendly banter in which we had agreed to, you know, there's plenty of times, right, you, you sort of exchange insults with someone in a sort of jovial way. This was not that. So I think that's what makes an act of humiliation. It's when someone who is in an asymmetric power relationship acts in such a way whose primary or maybe indeed only purpose is to highlight that power asymmetry in a way that is non-consensual. And one thing I want to note about this, and the more I thought about it, is how profoundly irrational acts of domination are. If you're in a position of power, really the last thing you want to do is to highlight that you have that power, to remind people of it, to make them resentful of it. You know, that's going to make them want to challenge you all the more. The Romans went and conquered the known world as a result of that feeling of domination, of humiliation, sorry. It's almost sort of like the... Um, Caesar and Augustus models of leadership. So Julius Caesar, sort of the first quote-unquote Roman emperor, and Augustus, the second one. Augustus does everything he can to disguise his power and to dress it up. He's just sort of first citizen. He shuns titles. He, he, he lets others have the dink, dignity and pomp and whatever. And all of it is, is designed to give the appearance to facilitate Romans who really wanted to go back to a republic, to allow them the sort of empty forms of maintaining a senate and so on, to sort of say, you know, no, hey, it's not that bad. I'm not trying to have it over you. 
Caesar is the other way. Caesar liked to have his purple robe. He liked to have the ornaments of power. He liked to humiliate people. There was a famous instance where one of the Roman, oh Christ, I'm going to forget to remember this now, but one of the sort of Roman officials or whatever refused to stand for Caesar. A very small act of protest refused to stand for Caesar's procession. And he shouts at him, Caesar from his chariot passing thousands of people around, he notices this one guy, he says, well, come on then, Rufus, take the Republic back from me. I'd say that's a humiliating act, right, or an act of humiliation. He's saying, what are you going to do? You're having your little Republican protest moment. What are you going to do? I have power over you. It's, it's overt in this case, right? and there's nothing, nothing you can do. Calls him out in front of everybody. And what happens? Augustus reigns peacefully for the rest of his life, and Caesar gets murked, right? Gets, gets cut up on the Senate floor. and. That, that is the thing, is like, if you want to have power, right, you can say this sort of like an individual, rational self-interest for wanting to have power. You don't want to antagonize the people you're exercising power over, and yet it seems like the norm is Caesar and not Augustus. Most absolute rulers demand flattery. How many stories do you know? Just pick your own of absolute rulers using humiliation, humiliating the people under them. Caligula apparently was um, assassinated because of acts of humiliation. He would make his guards say embarrassing words for the password and stuff like that. He liked to humiliate them, and they killed him. Now, they got killed shortly afterwards. Nobody, that's the thing, nobody was served by that. So why do we do it? Well, I think for that, you have to step outside of rational self-interest. Why do we do it? Well, have you never bullied anyone in your life? Have you never called someone a name? You know why you do it. We like it. It is at its heart an act of human parasitism. It, we are acting as social parasites in that moment. So my rough account I've just sketched out, and I think what's going on under that is almost like a mosquito or a tick or something. We are draining the honour and the dignity and the self-worth of our victim in order to enhance our own. It's parasitic. And I borrow that, by the way, from Orlando Patterson, who talks about the master-slave relationship as a parasitic one. And of course, slavery is the most violent and the most extreme form of a relationship of domination. And at its heart is this, this parasitism that the slave master draws his dignity and self-worth from the slave. But it's not rational. That's the thing. And it's not explicable rationally. It's not rational in terms of, like, egoic want fulfillment. It's also not model. And I want to just stress that and underline it. Acts of humiliation are necessarily immoral. And one very basic, but I think quite powerful argument you can give is just the good that comes out of it is so outweighed by the harm. As I said at the beginning, feelings of humiliation are very extreme psychological experiences and ones that stay with us. So consider the examples I gave. That instance of me being bullied in middle school, I, I can remember it today. I think it's shaped me. I think I've become a worse person, a more damaged person, maybe not from that one instance, but, but from enduring acts of humiliation. I can remember it now. I didn't have to, like, scratch about it. These things came back to me. Um, the Romans, that became part of their national <laughs> mythology. The, um, now, I don't know, I never followed up with them, but the homeless man I described, would it at 
all surprise you to hear him ten years later recounting that story angrily to another homeless man. These fuckers. You know what these one kids made me do once? Would it be at all psychologically implausible to find that even after the physical degradation and suffering and homeless of homelessness, that years later that 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 instance stuck in his craw? I don't know. Maybe it didn't. I find it easier to believe that he didn't forget it than that he did. Whereas by contrast, the good you get, the, the nourishment that the parasite receives, is completely trivial and very fleeting. It's not a deep or profound feeling. It's not something that brings deep joy or reverence for our fellow human beings. It's not something that nourishes or develops us or allows the best and noblest within us to thrive. It's an altogether fleeting and superficial and ultimately trivial need that we scratch. So, from a morally consequentialist point of view, the logic is clear that whether as an act or a rule utilitarian, this is, a, this is a, a grave moral wrong. Consider also, if you want to take a sort of more rights-based approach, the denial of autonomy. These acts are definitionally non-consensual. And there is a reason that we regard non-consensual acts, particularly extreme non-consensual acts, as grave moral evils. They're a denial of that person's ability to live their life in the way that they want to live. It's a profound attack on their freedom to bring in a political concept, right? So, acts of humiliation are necessarily bad in terms of the net sum of consequences that they produce. They're a profound attack on the innate dignity and autonomy of the person, and they're, a, they're an assault on their freedom. So, to summarise then, I would say acts of humiliation are acts that occur within a relationship of domination that are designed to highlight that domination without the consent of the dominated. I would say that the purpose, if we can think about them that way, is as a parasitic act of usurping the dignity and honour and self-worth of the victim in order to enhance that of the perpetrator. If that's like the underlying purpose, though, I would say that then there's also an unintended consequence, and the unintended consequence is anger. People become furious at being humiliated, often out of all consideration for sort of what rational self-interest would dictate. And again, think about my three examples. The Romans were furious about that act of humiliation a thousand years later, still stuck in their craw. I'm still in some sense angry about being bullied in middle school. And I can't speak for the homeless man, but like I say, I would find it eminently plausible if he was still angry about that. That, that would seem very normal and unexpected to me. And that's where humiliation fits in to this broader Republican theory. So it's an adjacent concept, along with this idea of the haves and have-nots, that sort of fleshes out what's so toxic, or one of the things that's so toxic about domination. Why domination is necessarily a threat to our freedom is... You can have domination without acts of humiliation, but it just seems to be in human nature that most of the time people have domination, they use it to humiliate. And even if they don't, we're always having the potential to be humiliated when we place ourselves in those situations. But there's also a more dynamic note in that, like I said, the purpose is this parasitic draining of the honour of the victim. But the unintended consequence is anger. 
And that anger, in turn, has a political role. So one thing I noticed about Machiavelli was again and again, he goes out of his way, and in a way he knows will be counterintuitive and counter-expectational, to defend riots. Um, both in the Florentine histories and in the discourses, he specifically goes out of his way to say big, messy, sometimes even violent explosions of popular rage are good and desirable. In a way he must have known was shocking to his audience. So what's going on here? This is what I think it is. When you have a relationship of domination, say the rich and the poor, as I argued in my homelessness case. I think when it's, if it's a small difference, it's not. But when it's a big difference, that is a relationship of domination. So Rousseau, for instance, says in his ideal republic, none will be so rich as to be able to buy another person, and none will be so poor as to have to sell themselves. So that's a statement saying we favour comparative income inequality, but the selling and the buying of persons gives you a hint as to what's really underlying that preference. It isn't a sort of utilitarian preference for the highest welfare standard. It's not a Rawlsian argument about, like, you having a right to a particular set of resources. No, it's grounded in the idea of domination and ownership. It's, it's grounded in the power that extreme wealth gives you and the powerlessness that is inflicted on you when you don't. So if you grant me that the extreme, not, not like small, but extreme wealth inequality is a relation of domination, in that relation, the, the more powerful group will exercise that power in a way that's humiliating. And you can think of that. Listen to, there's a chapter in Machiavelli where he goes on about how the rich would just constantly go out of their way to insult the poor. Well, don't we know that today? The poor are lazy. They're feckless. How much like social stigmatization of poverty? The poor are stupid. The poor is deserving of their poverty. What a morally grotesque thing to say, right? It's like saying someone deserves to be tortured or someone to say that someone deserves to be homeless, right? Those acts within that relationship of domination, we're looking at rich and poor here, those acts will produce anger. And that anger has to go somewhere. It has to be directed at something. But there's not recourses, there's not avenues through which it can challenge itself to push back. The rich have all the speaking slots on media, they control the convention, they control the dominant governing ideology of that society that says they deserve their position. But it has to go somewhere, and occasionally it just explodes in these popular outbursts, that may very well not be rational. I keep comparing this, by the way, to like a rational self-interest theory. You know, Machiavelli didn't have that. I'm just contrasting it with one of the modes of analysis at the time. But you get these big explosions of anger. And they can go three ways. They can either be put down, just stamped out, you know, crushed. They can be so big and so destabilizing that they actually rip up the constitutional order. Or Machiavelli says there's a third option, which is they lead to freedom. And what that role is, is there's enough of a critical mass that the prevailing power structure, the dominating forces have to give a little. They have to compromise. They have to, they have to allow that other group of people a seat at the table. And again, I think it's in that act of successfully standing up for yourself in solidarity with others that we find freedom. I think that is the freedom in not in not being dominated, but the freedom in resisting domination. The freedom maybe in partially resisting domination. So to recap, in every society, there's lo those who have power and dominate, and those who don't and are dominated. It tends to be a psychological feature of human beings that those with the power to dominate will use that power 
to inflict acts of humiliation on the dominated. Acts of humiliation being acts designed to highlight that domination without the consent of those dominated. They do so irrationally, at least by our standards of rationality, and for the parasitic and immoral purpose of sucking out their dignity and self-worth to polish their own ego. Those acts, however, have an unintended consequence, which is anger. And that anger can find collective expression in big, messy, and also often irrational explosions of the popular will. Sometimes those explosions don't achieve anything. Sometimes they achieve too much. But sometimes a new order can be carved out where concessions have to be granted and certain protections are allowed. And the dominated, together with others, have drawn a line in the sand and claimed a bit of dignity and self-worth back for themselves. Now, that's a particular account or sketch or theory of political change. But what I want to highlight there is the, the instrumental role that this idea of acts of humiliation plays in that theory. It's a crucial link in the story that the entire story wouldn't be possible without. So, what are we to make of this then? How might we say, is this an improvement or a degradation of the original Republican ideological structure that I started with? How would you even begin to assess such a question? What would make one particular configuration of concepts better or worse than the other? Well, I actually have a whole episode on this called Our Ideologies True, but very, very briefly, um, Frieden proposes two ways with which we could sort of assess the truth status of ideologies, which he says are enlightened argument and um, external coherence with facts. So enlightened argument, we can look at what this does to this conceptual structure of the ideology and sort of ask, does that make sense? Do we think it makes it better or worse? And then we can also just ask, does this seem true? Does this seem to be an account of the world that is validated or refuted by empirical facts? So taking both in turn, enlightened deliberation. I'm not sure I can offer you that, but I'm going to give it a go. Looking at this internal structure then, at the very heart, the core of Republican ideology, we have freedom, liberty, and non-domination. We have clusters of adjacent concepts around that, including participatory politics, self-rule, so on and so forth. And then we have perimeter practices that they're linked to. The perimeter, again, remembering, being like the membrane through which political thoughts and political actions pass back and forth. Well, by putting these new concepts in, the few and the many, the haves and the have-nots, and this idea of humiliation at the adjacent level, this seems to me to do a number of things to this ideological structure. I think it reinforces and strengthens the core, and it makes it more visceral and more immediate and more, more accessible, because as it is, there is an intuitive force to republicanism. There is a force to saying, I don't want anyone with power over me. That just has an intuitive appeal. I think it adds something to this idea of non-domination to also have that fear of being humiliated as well, to say we don't want people to have power over us because of how often that power is used to humiliate us. We do not want to be humiliated. And I think that's very powerful and very real for many people. And I think so much of politics, for better and for worse, is motivated by feelings of humiliation and feelings of anger about it. I also think it strengthens this idea of liberty. It gives us a non-ideal conception of freedom as being found in resisting 
domination, in carving out spaces for ourselves in which we can have solidarity with others. We can find that. And I'll give you a few real world examples of those in a minute. So I think it meshes well with those core concepts and it adds argumentative and discursive and intuitive weight to them. I also think it helps us bring on board a a, a new theory of change that I think answers some of the questions that are left wanting in contemporary discourse. So republicanism, I would say, is a broadly left-wing, at least neo-republican ideology in its current form. But is it liberal or sort of socialist or social democratic or democratic socialism, whatever you want to call it? How does it stand on that divide? Well, in my own empirical work, I found that it sort of bridges the two. People from anywhere from actually the centre right to the far left will find Republican core concepts intuitive. So it actually has something that um, makes it accessible to a quite broad range of people. Now, one of the, the big struggling blocks between the sort of liberal centre, shall we say, and the sort of socialisty left is theory of change, right? It's something all republic all ideologies have to give us. All ideologies have a theory of change. When we think about what desirable social change is, are we talking about incremental change, a line on a graph going up, justice as an ideal, justice as the shining light at the end of the staircase which we are ascending, or are we thinking about a radical break as as a sudden starting of a new slate, a tearing down of these corrupt and rotten institutions and building something new in its place? These are sort of the the, the two. And I think bringing in this idea of the few and the many and talking overtly about the role of humiliation in political change allows us an idea of positive social change as resistance and of forcing concessions from power structures that I think gives us the best of both worlds in some ways. I think the things I find most objectionable about the liberal theory of change and the things I find most objectionable about the radical theory of change are actually answered by this account that we get when we modify the ideological structure, the morphology is the technical world word, when we modify the ideological morphology of neo-republicanism. So, what I find most annoying or unacceptable, and I think a lot of people share this, about the, the liberal theory of change, is not that it's too slow per se, it's that it rules too much stuff out. I don't want to tear down the system. I think there's a lot of horrible things about our current political system, I think there's a lot of desirable things. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But liberals have a habit of policing, of saying, well, that's not how you go about a protest, that's not the that's not how you do that, right? No, we can't, like, be these big, messy things. Whenever, you know, some black guy gets shot unjustly by the police and there's this huge explosion of rage and anger, there's always this admonishment, make sure it's nonviolent, make sure it's peaceful, you know, let's not get carried away now. There's a finger, it's not that it's incremental that bothers me. There's a finger-wagging quality to it that I find annoying and I know a lot of other people find annoying. So remember Machiavelli's standard when he assesses popular protest tumults, he calls them. But I think, you know, it might be slightly less historical, but we can use the word riots if you think about the events that he's describing. What's his argument? His argument is very few people died. He's not talking about, was this civil? Did it respect your opponent? Did it, did it steal man and not straw man? I hate that. I'm sick of that. No, not that many people died. And 
I think what's what's interesting about that is this is just pure brute force moral consequentialism. But I think the argument would go something like this: is yeah, these big protests are messy. Yeah, they can be damaging. Maybe in some riots, even a couple of people die every now and again. The people in charge of our society, if you leave them unchecked, will destroy the state. People in power act when that power is unchecked, act profoundly irrationally. And this humiliation thing really sheds light on it. They will destroy their own ability to exercise power if you let them. They will use that power to humiliate. They will use it against their own long-run strategic interest. And you can just see this. The more concentrated power is, the worse it is exercised. Look at many of, even just in our current world, of the dictators. Think about your Gaddafis, your Saddam Husseins, your Kim Jong-uns. These are not rational or reasonable people. These are people who are destroying their societies and their states. These are people who themselves very often end up being violently killed and a whole load of people with them. But they don't exercise that power in a rationally self-interested way. Indeed, one of the striking things about dictators is, with a few exceptions, how consistently they self-sabotage. It's not as extreme, but the way the oligarchic ruling class in America has exercised its power shows a similar sort of lack of regard for their own long-run self-interest. They screamed and they kicked and they wailed about the New Deal reforms, and then they fought consistently and partially successfully to remove them all. They've been willing to trade, having an additional million dollars once you already have a billion, for creating forms of social inequality and oppression that are societally destabilizing. One of um, FDR's big arguments for the New Deal was, let's do a little bit of socialism so we don't have to do a lot. Let's not go the way of Germany and Russia, guys. That could happen. They would not have it. And we are today, I think, in an increasingly destabilized society. You have to force elites to behave in their own self-interest. And if the mechanism through which we do that is big and messy and disruptive, what is that in comparison? What is it in comparison? Yeah, it's not civil. (laughs) It's It's not conforming to your delicate rules of etiquette. So what if we don't really try and wrest power this dominating power from our arrogant and malicious and irrational elites. They will use that power to destroy us, themselves, and everything else, because that's what they do. That's what they've always done. The only states that have achieved stability, that have achieved long-run prosperity, are those where that power has been checked by the sometimes irrational often if not always uncoordinated and messy and emotional explosions of anger in the populace that have made room for it. Rome was made free and powerful by the rioting of its plebs. The race riots that eventually forced the partial inclusion of black Americans within our political system made America more free and more powerful and more stable and secure today. And the degradation of our working class, the uncoupling of productivity from gains, the immiseration of the bottom 30% of the country, the destruction of our unions, all of this, you know, starting in the 70s and 80s and running through to today, all of that has made America less free, less stable, and less powerful. So, on the one hand, this just provides a very refreshing and decidedly illiberal alternative to what I think people feel is a a sort of mealy-mouthed approach on the part of centrists and liberals 
to what effective political change can be. On the other hand, the purpose maybe not for the individual people involved in it, but the ultimate gain that we get from these big explosions is that disenfranchised groups, be they the poor, be they black Americans, be they LGBTQIA Americans, actually, for that matter, is they gain a seat at the table. And that answers what I find most troubling about radical theories of change, because there's very little that's wrong with their critical assessment. You know, they're, they're quite right to point out the ways in which racism and so on are operative in our society at all levels. But this disengagement from the political, this viewing any act of political participation, even voting defensively to keep Donald Trump out of the White House, as a symbolic support of you know, I just can't bring myself to vote for Hillary Clinton. For the life of me, I will never understand this. And this view is completely counter to that. The whole point of these big, illiberal, emotional explosions of popular anger is to get the seat at the table. To not participate politically once you've won that right is like fighting a war with a country over a particular territory, and then giving the territory back to them afterwards. So this, this vision of political change that I think comes from this, I think really answers that. And I think the inclusion of humiliation within that reinforces that, it makes it more real, and it adds a structural coherence to it that you wouldn't have otherwise. And then finally, is this externally coherent? Is this true? I've argued, I think, enlightened deliberation, or my best attempt at it, shows us that the inclusion of these concepts, the inclusion of humiliation within this neo-republican ideological structure, enriches the structure, it lets it branch out into new areas, it gives it more weight, I think it would make it more ideologically competitive. Is it true? Well, I think it is, actually. I think there's a great deal of psychological research we have now um, that validates this, that when people are in positions of power, they tend to act to humiliate others, and that that's a function not so much of the people but of the position that they're in, that we all have this. We all desire at the same time to humiliate people and not to be humiliated. You have those two wolves in your heart fighting, and the one that thrives, is uh, such a cliche, right, but is the one you feed, and you feed it by being in a position of domination. So there's a lot in the psychology literature that will back this up. I think the other field that you could apply this to that will back this up is um, intersectionality studies, you know, sort of much maligned social justice warrior speak. But I think, and this goes way beyond, you know, anything historical Republicans have argued, but I think a lot of this applies very clearly to struggles for liberation of not just the poor, but black Americans, gay Americans, women, all sorts of different groups. And again, I made the argument that I think extreme wealth inequality is a relation of domination, not between individuals, but between groups. I think you can pretty clearly say that America, you know, within living memory, having been an overtly white supremacist state, that's a system, that's a structure of domination too. Again, not within individuals, but between groups. And I think there's, there's a lot of elements to this account that really ring true to me. I think one of the things that sympathetic white liberals you fail to appreciate and are consistently sort of surprised by and don't take into account enough is how, and, and I include myself in this, 
by the way, this is something I forget and have to remind myself, is how angry victims of racial discrimination feel. This isn't at all to validate some unpleasant stereotype of the angry black man. I'm not talking a rage that embarrasses other people. I'm talking an internal rage and gnawing at your gut. And, you know, maybe as a white guy, I'm not best placed to understand this, but there is a lot of work in sort of intersectionality studies and critical race theory on anger. And I think that validates this and it speaks to this. And I think that should be how we regard that anger as not only understandable, but predictable as the normal response to being victim of acts of humiliation within the, the structure of domination that you are forced to participate within. I think what I talked about in terms of finding freedom in a collective act of resistance, in an assertion of your dignity, in saying no, can also be seen by many of the structurally dominated groups in America. And in a way that I think we should pay more attention to and find meaningful and find beautiful. I'll give you just one example, which is the familiarization of these groups, the, the, the bonds of thinking about people, not just as people who are pursuing the same rational interest as you, but as kin, as those who are loved. Think about in unions the constant evocation of a brotherhood. Comrade, DSM people (laughs) will say, right? Think about the familiar terms of address that black Americans have evolved to use with each other in response to humiliation and violence on behalf of a white-dominated society. Brother, sister. What could possibly be any clearer example of this than the reclaiming of slurs. We're going to take the N-word and make it our word. We're going to... What could not be a more perfect example of reclaiming dignity in the face of domination and humiliation? And it's in these bonds that freedom is found. Freedom isn't an abstract property. It's a felt, lived experience. It's an experience that flows through all of these little social pathways we create, where we validate the fact that we have fought out these spaces for ourselves, in which, collectively, we can ensure some protection for our kin those who we love, those who are part of our moral tribe, in the face of an oppressive, dominating society. Freedom and value and meaning is found there. And I think this account just really neatly parallels with and can be woven with a lot of what I find valuable about intersectional theory. And as a parallel, you know, You can talk about the ideal is non-domination. People say, surely we've got to get to a colorblind society. Yeah, I agree. That sounds like a, a wonderful utopian vision. And I hope we can get there. And I'm more optimistic than some on the social justice left that, you know, in the distant future, that might be possible. But we also have to make normative sense of the present in which we are enmeshed in these structures of domination in which we are collectively humiliated. And to the critic who wants to say, oh, identity politics makes everything about group and I don't see race and, you know, you can't go around looking at the world just based on who's in your in-group and who's in your out-group, I'd say, well, yes and no. We have to look at race because it shouldn't matter, but it does. And we have also to grant a little bit of epistemic humility. We have also to grant that, you know, 
we as white people don't always know what that particular kind of discrimination feels like, and that we may not be best placed to speak on it. I think that's certainly true. The opponent of thinking about the world in this way will sort of say, well, but you mean I can never say anything about race? Are you telling me that only, you know, black people can talk about it? Well, no, that would be going too far, too. And I think this way of looking at it does have an internal regulating mechanism in that there are certain types of experiences of humiliation that I will not be best placed to understand as a white man, and there are forms of solidarity in which those victims find meaning that I will never have access to. You know, it'll, it'll probably never be all right for me to use the N-word, for instance, and that's okay. You know, I've no particular desire to anyway, but that that is a, you know, form of identity that we take seriously, and that is going to be there, at least for the foreseeable future. On the other hand, I said at the beginning, if I did get something good out of it, that experience of being bullied has made me more empathetic. And I think this account that I've given does draw together a number of different experiences and locate a common core. That feeling of powerlessness and that feeling of anger when the state of your domination is highlighted to you without your consent. I think having tasted it myself, makes me more empathetic to others and makes me much more ready to join them and fight with them when they do push back. Now, it's not completely the same. I want to be careful with that claim. I'm not, I'm not at all saying that me getting you know, picked on in high school or middle school, sorry, is the same as racial do dominance. It's, it's much more trivial, and I'm sure there are important qualitative differences. But what I'm saying is I think it's a balance. I think we have to admit that groups matter, and to the person who wants it to be purely colorblind and purely individualistic, that might be a nice ideal theory, but in terms of making normative sense of the present, we, we have to admit that there are particular group experiences that we're not going to have access to. At the same time, I think this theory does allow us to recognise that, but still assert and maintain a common humanity. To still sort of say, we can join together, we can stand together, we can relate to each other imperfectly, but we can still relate to each other and there will be specific forms of those relations that are unique to groups, but there will be broader forms in which together we can find dignity and we can find meaning in our resistance to domination and the acts of humiliation that always come with it. The final test of an ideology, of course, is does it fly? Does it take off? And I can't be the judge of that. I've argued that including these ideas of the many and the few, the idea of humiliation, as I've described it, within the structure of neo-Republican ideology, enriches that structure, it gives it normative weight, and it's ultimately true. I think it's validated by the world, both what we know from psychology and what we know from intersectional theory. I've argued that, but ultimately, you know, ideologies aren't worth much if people don't pick them up and use them. Does this feel intuitive for you? As I've talked about this, has your mind flickered back to particular instances where your own powerlessness was made apparent to you, and it stung, and it stayed with you? Has your mind flickered to instances where you have done that to other people? And let me break this to you. You have done that to other people. It was wrong. There was no justification for it. But you did it anyway.
Finally, bringing it in to this broader structure, using it to flesh out an account of liberty, using it to develop a theory of change. Just take that pair of glasses and put them on. Does the world make sense when viewed through those glasses? Or not? I can't decide if people will want to wear those glasses, if they'll find them intuitive or normative, but I think they are, and I offer them to you in the hope that you will too.